Happy New Year. I'm Shane. This is Relative Time and welcome to 2021. You know, 2020 was a heck of a year filled with some ups and mostly downs. Yet despite all of that, I got to see a lot of great watches thanks to this channel. Now, I know a lot of you would rather put the entire year in the rearview mirror and never look back. But at the beginning of each year, I try to reflect on the best watches of the previous year. So today we're going to take a look at the top 10 watches of 2020. Now, just as in previous years, these aren't the top 10 watches period, but the top 10 watches that I got to review. And I got to tell you, it was pretty hard narrowing this list down. I think I looked at 50 some watches last year and there were a lot of really good ones. Also, some of you might have noticed the sponsor tag at the beginning, and that's there because on a couple of the watches on this list, they were given to the channel when I did the original review, so I threw that up as a precaution. In the video's description, probably near the bottom, I'll go into more detail on what was given, what was borrowed, and what was bought for those that want to know. But for now, let's get to it, and I want to start off with a watch that I think embodies both the best and the worst of Seiko. So at number 10, we have the Seiko SPB-119J1, or the Ghost Albinist. Out of the watches on this list, this is probably the most controversial one. After the forced retirement of the green Saab 017, there was a lot of excitement when Seiko announced the return of the Albinist with four new colorways. Yet once people learned that the new ones would cost almost twice what you can get the old one for, there was a bit of a backlash. Now, despite all this, and despite the early adopter fee that Seiko charged me for this one, it's still one of my favorites for the year. The images here really speak for themselves, as it's simply stunning with its off-white ghostly dial, especially when it's paired with this beads of rice bracelet. I mean, this thing is just gorgeous and nicely balanced on my wrist. It's a watch with roots that stretch back over 50 years into Seiko's history and this white dial version is a clean and extremely versatile design, easily bridging the gap between casual and field just by swapping out a strap. There's a reason a lot of people love the Alpinus. It's a gorgeous design that's easy to read, as a field watch should be. It's a watch that can really do it all, and in that way I think it really represents what people love about Seiko. Yet at the same time, it also represents what people hate about Seiko these days as they are no longer the king of value, and QC issues are popping up at price points where they shouldn't. So the 2020 Alpinist is a watch that I love, but one I'd have a hard time recommending, at least at its current price. Now, while the Alpinist is a bit short on value, number nine on this list has it in spades, as when you're talking about Vostoks, you always get a lot of bang for your buck. Yet this isn't just any Vostok but the most unusual one I've seen to date. So at number nine, we have the Amphibio Reef GMT. This is one of the newer designs from Vostok, and it is a bit different by not only having a GMT hand, but dual bezels. The first is an internal compressor style bezel for the GMT, as well as a traditional 60 minute timing bezel on the exterior. Now this does make the watch a bit thick at 15 millimeters, but that's kind of standard for a lot of Vostoks, and it offers a whole lot of functionality, especially at a price of around 165 bucks. So it is a bit more than your standard Amphibia, but it's still very affordable, especially for a GMT. I've seen a lot of Vostoks over the last few years, and this is one of the more memorable and coolest ones I've seen. There aren't too many dual bezel watches running around, so it'll be a while before you see another like it. So at number eight, we have the Orient Star Outdoor, which probably won't be a big surprise to you regular viewers. Now, I love Orient, and I love field watches. So when I heard that Orient had a new Orient Star field watch, I was immediately obsessed. Orient always offers you a lot of bang for your buck, and the Orient Star line even more. Here you have a great finish, sapphire crystal, good loom, and an upgraded movement with a 50 hour power reserve which you can clearly see on the dial with the power reserve indicator. That indicator isn't something you see too often in this price range, but it's something that's become kind of a staple with the Orient Star line. Overall, it's a simple clean design with a massive presence on the wrist. It also seems to have a lot of aviation inspired elements, and this black one in particular has a strong sin vibe to it. 
which makes it a bit atypical for a field watch, but it's a look I love, especially on this green ostrich strap. Once I put this thing on it, I couldn't take it off. It just gives it a little bit of color without really distracting from the dial. There's only two real downsides to this one. The first is that 21 millimeter lug width, and the other is that they can be hard to find, which also means that prices vary wildly. This year, I was lucky enough to see a number of watches from Zellos, and they're all fantastic in their own way. But I think the Horizons GMT and the Mako V3 are my two favorites. While the Horizons is a fantastic watch and a near-perfect GMT, I think the more accessible Mako 3 represents more of what people love about Zellos, as it's a watch that strikes a perfect balance between originality, size, comfort, specs, and price, which is why number 7 on this list is the Mako V3. I fell in love with this watch at first glance, and that's all thanks to this Whirlpool Galoche dial. And once I finally got it in hand, it was a watch that exceeded all expectations. This dial is simply amazing in person, as is the Loom, where you have a great mix of green C3 and blue BGW9 Super Luminova. Out of all the Zealouses I've seen, this is the most striking, and probably the most comfortable, as it has a width of 40mm and a really slim lug to lug. It is a little bit tall, but a lot of that is due to this domed crystal which I think really elevates that Whirlpool effect. Now, unfortunately, like most watches from Zelos, this thing is sold out, so you'll have a hard time finding one. But if you happen to run across one, it's one I'd highly recommend. Coming in at number six, we have a recent review of a near textbook perfect field watch with the Swiss watch company's bunker. I reviewed this one only a couple of weeks ago. I think that was right when they came out and the response was really positive as it sold out in a couple of days. So if you missed out, I think Swiss Watch Company will eventually have more. I just don't know when. But if you didn't check out that review and you're a fan of classic field watches, like say from Hamilton, then this is one to definitely check out. At around $445, you're talking a lightweight titanium case, 10 millimeters thick, high beat Salita movement, and some of the best loom I've ever seen. And I'm not just talking on a field watch, but best loom period, as it has 20 layers of X1 grade Super Luminova, and that's enough to outshine most of the divers I've run across. It's a fantastic combination for anyone that loves field watches. I mean, it's pretty hard to go wrong with this one. The only downside I see with the bunker is that if you already have something like a Hamilton khaki, at which point you might want something a bit more different. So if you fall into that category, go check out the Orient Star Outdoor, as well as a few others that I'm going to mention shortly. Coming in at number 5, we have a sister watch of sorts for the Mako 3, and that's with the Axios flagship. Now, these two watches are close to each other in size and spec, but very, very different in style. Where the Mako is more modern and casual, the flagship is a little bit more retro and dressy. This is a watch that really surprised me as when I first got it, I knew the build quality was spot on, but I wasn't quite sure about the styling. Yet, somehow I found myself reaching for it time and time again, and not only when I was doing the review, but months after. Mostly because it is extremely comfortable on the wrist, and even more so than the Mako. It's a little bit smaller sitting right at 40, and a little bit thinner at just over 13. Plus, with this beads of rice bracelet, it not only looks fantastic, but perfectly wraps around my 7-inch wrist. The retro styling here isn't going to be for everyone, but if you like the look, then it is definitely worth checking out, as it's a watch with great build quality and pretty good loom as well. These days, I think a lot of watch geeks have kind of a love-hate relationship with Seiko. I mean, just looking at the comments I got on that Alpus review is proof of that. Yet our next watch is one that really helped me revitalize my faith in Seiko, that they still have the ability to create a great affordable watch for everyday people. So, coming in at number 4, we have the Seiko 5 SRPE61, which is one I nicknamed the Silver Shadow. Now, this is one of the newer 40mm Seiko 5 sport watches, which some have nicknamed as the Dress KX line. This is a watch that I really wasn't eager to review, I kind of thought the entire concept was a gimmick. It's basically a smaller, bezel-less, dressier SKX. 
Yet once I got it in hand, I quickly realized how wrong I was. In fact, after spending some time with this one, I think these are the new go-to watch for anyone's first automatic. I mean, it's a fantastic size and extremely comfortable, as well as being very usable and fairly affordable now that the prices have started coming down. I think over the holidays, these were on sale from around 150 to 180 bucks, and I got a number of comments from people that found them on sale recently and just loved them. Although for me, the one to get is the silver dial version. I mean, just look at these images here. This one is simply fantastic, and I think it creates one of the best affordable sports watches out there, as it can easily shift between dress and casual. It just depends on what you have it on. Now, if you already have an extensive collection of watches, you're not going to have a good reason to get one of these. But if you're just starting out in watches, then this is one I would definitely check out. When people think of field watches, they usually think of something like a Hamilton khaki, which is originally a World War II design. Yet the original field watches from World War I were a bit different, and perhaps a little bit more elegant. Which is where the next watch on our list comes in. So at number three, we have the Vario 1918 trench watch. Now I think Vario is more known for their watch straps and accessories than anything else. But every once in a while, they do come out with their own watch. And this latest one that was recently on Kickstarter was a complete home run. I think on Kickstarter, it was fully funded in hours. And at the end, they had almost 10 times their original goal. There are a few different versions, but the one I got to look at is the smaller one which is 37 millimeters wide and 12 millimeters thick. Now, keeping with the style, the trench watch uses a set of fixed lugs. So your standard two-piece straps aren't gonna work here, but any NATO or Zulu should be fine, as well as it comes with this really cool bun strap. While the style is based on the original trench watches of World War I, the build quality is modern, as you have 100 meters of water resistance, double dome sapphire, as well as an enamel dial. So it's a gorgeous, highly functional watch that's really built for everyday life. This is one I was really impressed with. At its heart, it's still a tool watch, but perhaps it's a more elegant one or a more civilized age. So if you're keeping track here, I've already shown four great field watches. And even though I consider the next watch to be more of a sports watch, it's technically sold as a field. Which means out of the 10 watches on this list, five are field watches. I didn't really realize it till I put this list together, but I guess 2020 was the year of field watches. Yet one thing I love is that they all have their own distinct style and distinct personality. Some are a little more classic and some are pretty original. And that is especially true of our next watch, which might be the most original yet. So coming in at number two, we have the Ryza Resolute. You know, when I first saw pictures of this thing, I really wasn't sure what to think. But once I got the prototype in hand, I quickly fell in love with it. I hadn't seen anything quite like it. Now, while the modern angular case is pretty cool, I think the dial really steals the show. It's a simple, clean design with a matte gray texture, and one that kind of matches the titanium case nicely. Yet the fume gradient on the dial and the black highlights with the white indices, they really pop here with just a surprising amount of visual appeal, and especially so from something that's really a monochrome palette. While the indices aren't very tall, they create just enough depth to keep things interesting. Now, one quick note is that they have changed their name, or at the very least, they've changed their spelling. And I think on future versions, the new logo will be on the dial. This thing really is fantastic, and the only downside that I kind of see with it is that it is on the higher end for having a Seiko NH35A movement. But I don't think that should really stop anyone. There's nothing really wrong with that movement. And overall, it's a pretty fantastic package. It's a great size, comfortable in the wrist, with a great original design. It's a watch that really sticks with you, which is why it's my second favorite for the year. Now, before we get to number one, I have a few honorable mentions. The first is the Solus Starlight. This is the most difficult watch I had to film this year, but I think it's also one of the most interesting ones I got to see, and especially from a technical standpoint, as it's using a newer, affordable micro rotor movement. It's a very difficult watch to really capture, and especially so with the adventuring dial. 
but it is gorgeous in person. So if you didn't catch the original review, it is definitely worth taking a look. Next, we have the Chronos 62 Moss Homage. This is the best AliExpress watch I saw this year. Now, as it's an homage, originality isn't going to be its strong suit, yet it has a fantastic build quality. It's a gorgeous dial and amazing loom. The only thing I'd really knock it for is that it does say Diver's 200 meter rating on the dial, which makes it seem like it's an ISO rated diver when it's not. It's something that I complained to them about, but they seem to have ignored that because they have some newer watches with the same thing. So that can cause some confusion, but if you're okay with it, this is really a watch that's made right. Now, the next two watches, I'm just going to give you a brief preview of. These are two that I got this year, but I didn't quite get around to reviewing them, and hopefully I'll have a review out in the next month. Yet, if I had got around to doing it, I think these two would have made it on this list. So first off, we have another Orient Star, and this one is a dress watch. As far as I know, this one doesn't have a nickname, and I'm pretty sure it's a JDM exclusive, so it might be kind of hard to get. But it is simply amazing to look at, and perhaps a worthy challenger to the Sarp 033s out there. And lastly, we have the Orion Hellcat, and just look at this thing and you'll know why I got it. This thing is gorgeous, but it did take over a year to get to me. It's a great watch, but maybe a little bit pricey, but I am pretty eager to get this review out. So hopefully I'll have it done in the next few weeks. So without further ado, coming in at number one, we have the Orient Star Diver, which is my favorite watch for the year. Now this one is far from perfect. I mean, it is a little large at 43.6, and its bezel and bracelet are a little disappointing, and especially compared to either the Zealous or the Axios that was on this list earlier. In that regard, those two put this thing to shame. Yet for the Orient Star, the build quality is fantastic, as well as the dial and the hands. I mean, just look at the macro shots of these hands, I just can't get enough of them. Not to mention, just like with the outdoor, you get an upgraded movement with an extended power reserve. I'm typically not a Pepsi guy, but there was just something about this watch and the dial that I really fell in love with. And for whatever reason, the design here really resonates with me, which is probably why it's my favorite. Perhaps it's just the unusual nature of it. Plus, having some of the best loom I've seen doesn't hurt either. Now, like a lot of Orient stars, this one isn't wildly available, and as such, prices really fluctuate depending on where you look. Yet, if you just happen to find a good price for one, then it's definitely worth taking a second look at. Or, at the very least, go check out the review again. Well, that about wraps it up for 2020, and hopefully I'll have the reviews out on the Hellcat and the Orient Star pretty soon. But in the meantime, let me know down below what you think about these watches and what your favorite watch from last year was. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me.